Cool. So that's that. So uh, today, um, the lecture topic is uh, connectivity. And um, I'm forgetting to uh, change the battery on my pointer. So, so it still points, but it still it doesn't click. It's kind of weird. Maybe it's just broken. Um, yeah, your question? Yeah, uh, uh, curiosity, would you be a Xamarin computer or right? Yeah, so um, it's in a test, it's implemented in test vision. It's also something that these rostering people do automatically. Uh, so it's an online uh, thing. Okay, so it's, uh, because I'm asking about the open uh, question, so I have to type. Okay, yeah. 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 yeah, it's also better for the the handwriting issue. Yeah, well, I'm not 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 you specifically, but uh, I've I've seen issues. Um, uh, <laughs> so uh, today I want to uh, talk about something that uh, uh, is uh, a large part of the literature on fMRI. So up until now, we've only been talking about specific experiments, right? Where you do like a working memory experiment, and how do you go about analyzing that? Right? Can you uh, for example, decode what people are remembering, uh, that sort of thing. All of that type of uh, analysis that you now know how it works, it's actually done on very specific experiments, right? With like a trial format sort of thing. Uh, and a lot of research uses that trial format. But today I want to go into um, a whole different type of analysis that we can also do uh, using fMRI data that centers more uh, on the connectivity of the brain. What I'm going to do is go first through anatomical connectivity. So how can we sort of assess already from anatomical acquisitions in the MRI machine, whether specific brain regions are connected with one another, and then see how we can use functional MRI to pull out similar types of results, i.e. are specific brain regions or voxels or what have you connected with one another? So, hence the word connectivity. So, um, yeah, so up until now, we've, we've gone only through these task experiments, right? Uh, you now know exactly how pre-processing works and the standardized uh, GLM thing. And uh, what you see a lot in terms of the words that people use to describe this type of approach of this task-based experiment uh, is called mass univariate, right? So it's a univariate analysis. You're analyzing single voxels, but you're doing so en masse, right? So it's in parallel across all voxels. So it focuses more or less on single voxels, uh, and you uh, check out how the bold signals in those voxels relate to your experimental design, how they coded in the design matrix. Um, and you, you care only... Uh, about the relation to that design matrix. You don't care about what the rest of the brain is doing. Yeah, so it's, if your design matrix encodes what's happening on a screen, what you're doing uh, is you're trying to explain brain data only as a function of what happens on the screen and not what happens in the rest of the brain. Yeah. And now um, that's kind of weird, right? Because if I show you the same image twice, you'll see the same image twice, but you might have a completely different interpretation of that same image, right? Your brain is not the same brain, even though the stimulus is the same, right? So the stimulus being the same in this paradigm where we relate brain responses only to the screen means that we anticipate exactly the same brain response over and over. But we know that this is not the case. Our brains are global information processing machines, and what happens in one part of the brain influences what happens in another part of the brain. And so if we're interested in that type of thing, and you see how this is interesting, right? It, it relates to subjective experience, for example, right? That changes as we encounter the same stimulus multiple times. We remember it, for example. All of that type of interesting cognitive processing is not encoded uh, in a simple design matrix like that. So if we want to focus on this, uh, we need to focus on this connectivity. How does one brain region influence the processing that happens in another brain region? Now, the first thing I want to talk about here is, uh, is anatomical connectivity, because it's really one of the basic things that people uh, refer to when they talk about connectivity. 
And this is really the mainstay uh, of uh, connectivity. So um, first, anatomical measures, and then later I'm going to go into functional uh, methods. And so you can see this as uh, uh, according to this schema here, right? We have a brain uh, and we can um, take anatomical acquisitions like histology or, or other types of imaging data and create a structural brain network, right? That's based on the anatomy here on the left side of this diagram. And what we can, like we can use the MRI machine in all sorts of different ways, right? So we can also get time series data from recording sites of the brain fMRI, of course. And then we end up uh, with a functional brain network. Right? And you would think that one is similar to the other, so they provide complementary views on this idea of connectivity with specific differences, of course. So I'm going to first focus uh, on this structural brain network uh, and really talk about uh, what we do when we perform connectivity based on anatomical imaging. So um, people have been asking this question of what connects to what or ages. Um, I showed you this diagram of the visual system that starts at the retina and then ends up at the hippocampus with this entire visual sort of network with all these regions in the middle, right? And I was talking about how, for example, the abstraction of processing increases as you go up this uh, hierarchy. Now, people didn't measure this hierarchy like just so, uh, what they actually did is tractography. Um, and um, this is actually very old work. Uh, it's where you inject something, a tracer, uh, at a specific location in the brain, and then it will propagate through the connections in the brain. Uh, if you then sacrifice an animal uh, after an X delay, you can see where the tracer ended up, right? So you get, one measurement of how the relation between of the relation between that injection site and where it ends up. So what you do is you take a rabies virus. So this is actually pretty um, dangerous work because if you accidentally jab yourself, you could die. Sort of thing. A rabies virus actually propagates along axons, right? So it infects uh, a neuron and then propagates along uh, the axons. And different uh, viruses propagate either in one direction or uh, the other. So you can locally inject that uh, tracer in some location and then wait an X delay. And this delay determines how many synapses the virus will uh, transition across, right? If you wait longer, it will be able to uh, jump over multiple synapses and thereby uh, you can actually measure sort of secondary connections by waiting longer, you uh, wait shorter, and then you get only the first connection. Okay. So this gives you an idea of really building up that network. Um, and uh, you can see how this type of methodology could get you enough information to construct this network of uh, the brain's connectivity. Now there's two different types of, um, uh, of tracers like this. Uh, one is retrograde, which infects a dendrite and then moves uh, along the axon. Uh, the other is uh, anterograde. It goes from the axon to the dendrite, right? So it's just the, the direction that it takes inside the uh, neuron. You can, do, you can go both ways, okay? And so um, what you then do is you can sacrifice the animal, which you do, um, and then you stain for this virus, right? So you can just do this biological staining of the tissue. Uh, is this virus present, right? Uh, and you can localize where it is. Thereby, if you remember where you injected, you can thereby draw a link between uh, where the virus ends up and where you injected the virus in the first place. Now, the problem here is, of course, that you go through a lot of animals. And most of the work here originates from the 50s, 60s, 70s, up until the 80s of the previous century, where people really didn't care uh, that much about this sort of thing. Um, uh, nowadays, uh, this work isn't done so much anymore. Yeah. Uh, so it, luckily, uh, this is not a big problem uh, at the moment because we have these MRI machines, right? Um, MRI has actually taken over this role. And it, even though it cannot work at the cellular level, it can provide whole brain measurements of, um, of connectivity. And so... Uh, I'll explain a bit 
but how the scanner does that, how that works. Uh, the specific term for this is diffusion tensor imaging. And um, it really centers on this concept that the scanner can do anything. One of the things that it can, uh, that it can quantify is whether and how much water diffuses. And so um, if you label water at one time point and then check whether it's diffused in a certain direction at a second time point, so normally in a glass of water, uh, this would cause you label it and then it diffuses. So it just becomes isotropically, as we call it. It moves the same in all directions and you just get a diffusion of this uh, magnetization and by labeling it at time point one and then measuring it uh, at time point uh, two. Now, the biological principle that this DTI is based on is the fact that axon bundles are actually little pipes, right? And that means that the water cannot diffuse in any direction like it would be able to in a glass of water. In an axon, it can only move along the axon. And so the water is actually trapped in the axon tubes. Right? It cannot move across. And therefore, all of the diffusivity, if you will, uh, will be along the axons. And if you can then measure this as a sort of signal, like a cigar-shaped signal that you see here, if you can pick that up with a scanner, which you can, uh, then that allows you to find the orientation of the axon bundles in the white matter of the brain using MRI. Is the principle clear? Great. Now, it's a completely different way of using the scanner. I won't go into the uh, physics specifically. Um, in some respects, it's very similar to fMRI. In others, it's very, very different. Um, and it gives you multiple. So this, this is that uh, cigar of diffusivity that you get. You get one at every voxel. Yeah? So every voxel in the brain uh, now doesn't have a time series, but now it has a sort of uh, amplitude for a bunch of angles that we measure. And that allows us to construct this sort of diffusivity cigar, if you will. But you get more measures than that. You, you get multiple measures that have to do with the diffusivity of the uh, water in all of the tissue in the brain. And the first is very simple. It's called fractional anisotropy. I was talking earlier about this isotropic homogeneous diffusiv diffusivity. And that is not anisotropic because anisotropic me means not isotropic. Are you still with me? Okay, good. So uh, how non-isotropic is the diffusivity in a given voxel is given by this fractional uh, anisotropy. Uh, so it gives you sort of the asymmetry of the diffusion. Right, how skewed the diffusion is inside a given voxel. What I'm showing you here uh, is an outline of what that looks like. And you see the white matter bundles in the brain light up because there the bundles are uh, very, very similarly oriented, which means that all this diffusivity that you measure with uh, MRI can only go in one direction, it means it's very, very asymmetric. Yeah. But the beauty of this thing is actually that you don't just measure how asymmetric it is, you actually have access to this entire cigar. Uh, I keep calling it a cigar, You're the thing, the Zeppelin. Um, and that is this extra type of information that you also get is the direction of the bundles, right? because you measure an amplitude for, let's say every little point on this Zeppelin, right? let's say that's a hundred different directions. Uh, you can actually reconstruct exactly where that, that Zeppelin is pointing. So you get the direction of the fiber bundles inside a, a voxel. And that allows you to reconstruct the local orientation of the bundles that you see. And so what you can do is actually color code the white matter in the brain according to what direction the, uh, the bundles are running inside each of the voxels. And there's like a standard direction encoding for that, the X direction is red, the Y direction is green, and the Z direction is blue. So if you see something that's blue there, it means the bundles there are moving from the top down or from the bottom up. 
inside the anatomy of the brain. Okay. This is of course beautiful information because you can see how if you know this locally, then uh, that gives you a very, very strong indication of what would be what would be connected to what. But you're not there yet. But at this point, we have a beautifully colored brain. It looks nice already. But we don't know yet uh, what is connected with what. We just know that there could be a path between and we know how that might run. But we actually need to do the work of tracing a possible connection from one region to the next. And we do that by tractography. I've shown you this in one of the earlier lectures. Uh, and I'm here just repeating it. So you have to actually estimate for each pair of locations whether a track between them is a sensible hypothesis, right? So uh, this is very computationally intensive, uh, but it, what it delivers is this actual network of uh, likely fiber bundles in the brain. Now it's important that you realize that this is a hierarchy of analysis steps, if you will. Yeah, so you start out with the basic information, how asymmetric is the diffusivity at each location. Then you say, okay, but I can distill the direction of the diffusivity. So I know the, or the local orientation of the fiber bundles, but then I have to like put them all together and say, okay, but this one then likely connects to that one. This one likely connects to that one. And this is all a matter of probabilities, right? And so a lot of this track tracing uh, is a very complex probability solving uh, type of method. So this, when you ever, whenever you see something like this, you need to understand that what you're looking at is an estimate of where the bundles are uh, running. It's not similar to the results of a GLM in terms of statistics. It's an estimate. Yeah. Any questions about this? Because I'm going to quickly move to functional MRI because that's what this course is all about. Great. I've never used it myself, so I couldn't explain anything further than what I'm showing you now. Um, one thing that's important, though, is that once you have a measure of connectivity, so for example, what you're seeing here uh, is this just this is just um, sliced up into regions. So you can take the cerebral cortex, splice it up into different regions according to, let's say, an atlas. Right? We've spoken about atlases, uh, and then uh, we can actually determine how strong the connection is between two regions in our atlas, right? We can just average across a bunch of voxels in that region and then we'll see uh, whether that region is connected to some other region. And so what we get is, is called here an anatomical coupling matrix. Uh, people call this sort of thing a connectivity matrix. If two things are very strongly correlated, uh, then they're bright. If they are, then they're uh, dark. Now, um, this sort of analysis uh, traces tracks from one location to all others and vice versa. And um, usually the end result of an analysis like this is that you uh, try to create a graph of what the connections in the brain uh, are like. Right? So certain elements in this matrix light up. It means that certain connections in the brain are strong, which means that you can select them. Uh, and then uh, you can Sort of convert that into visualizations such as this, uh, which is like a connectivity diagram. So very typical for this field uh, to construct this type of uh, measure. Um, it's not my field specifically, so I don't know um, the ins and outs of how people would interpret this, but generally the layout of, a, of something like this is that these things are all ordered according to the lobes of the brain. So here you see occipital, parietal, temporal, and so forth and so forth. Uh, and it's left hemisphere, right hemisphere. Right? And it, you see a lot of uh, symmetric connections. Uh, those are connections between similar brain regions uh, on opposite sides of the brain because we are bilaterally symmetric animals. Yeah? So our left motor cortex communicates very strongly with our right motor cortex, for example. So, yeah. Yeah, so there's different reasons, right? So um, the one is what you're hinting uh, at already. It is that if you know the anatomical connectivity, you have a scaffold by which you can start to interpret any functional connectivity that you uh, get. I'll get into that 
the association between anatomical and chronic function activity is limited to. But there are a lot of clinical studies that also do this sort of thing, where, for example, uh, people are doing this in uh, dyslexia, right? And then the idea, of, so especially in types of developmental disorders, uh, this is, of course, a very interesting type of measurement to do, uh, because if you can find a specific type of connection that suffers uh, or that deteriorates uh, when you have a certain disorder, uh, it gives you a lot of insight into what is the specific you know, mechanism that's going wrong, and that can also yeah, teach you how to work towards not just diagnostics, but also treatments. So developmental disorders, um, yeah, things like, uh, I've seen this used a lot in things like Parkinson's, and that sort of thing, where you expect there to be a change over longer time scales, which happens in development, but also in terms of certain clinical disorders. Any other questions? Because I'm moving to function in the next slide. It sounded almost like a threat. I didn't mean it like that. Okay, so uh, what's important for us being fMRI people, see what I did there? You're all fMRI people now. We can also use the time series that we have in the brain to estimate connectivity, but then we call it functional connectivity. Um, there's uh, different gradations, uh, but to be clear, right? What I'm going to do here is focus on the right side uh, of this diagram. So instead of taking an anatomical measurement, I'm going to take the time series at different locations in the brain, ER. Um, and then using those time series, we're going to try to see if we can find a functional brain network that we can derive from these, uh, from these measurements over time. Now, um, one thing that you already hinted towards is that if you have this uh, anatomical connectivity, unless you do it like years apart in the same subject, it's a static measurement, right? It doesn't vary over time. Whereas, you know, at the beginning of this lecture, your mental states were quite different from, the, uh, from what they are now, right? Now you're way more bored, for example. And um, you see that that type of dynamic change that happens on very fast time scales, we are completely, by definition, blind to if we're interested in this anatomical uh, connectivity, right? If we use that as a measure. And yeah, our brains are dynamic. And this is really the type of thing that we're interested in if we're interested in cognition, right? How the brain gives rise to mental processes. And so for that, we need to start looking at fMRI. Yeah, so we're going to uh, look at functional connectivity from fMRI, which we can, it's a type of analysis. So it's a different sort of uh, perspective on how you approach uh, fMRI data. Uh, you can do this sort of analysis both in task-based fMRI, and we'll get into that, uh, but you can also do it using resting state fMRI. And so later on in the lecture, I'll dive a bit more deeply into what the hell resting state fMRI is, because we haven't talked about it. And if you look at fMRI studies, about half, or something like that, actually perform what's called a resting state fMRI experiment. And uh, so uh, I would be uh, remit, remiss in not telling you about it. But first, let's go through task-based functional connectivity. Yeah, so that is, we're keeping it close to home. We're still doing exactly the same type of analysis uh, that we uh, are, or experiment that we were doing before, and even large parts of the analysis are the same, right? So our goal is to work towards something like this. I'm showing you here on the right is like a broad sort of pipeline that people use uh, in this context. Um, and this is just a recipe by which you can do this. One thing is that you could run a single trial GLM. So you have this task-based experiment, working memory, for example, every run has 40 trials or so. Yeah, that happens. You just Remember left, remember right, remember green, remember red, whatever. And so what you can then do is for every trial, create a regressor. What that means is you can run a GLM uh, and you would get a beta weight for every trial. Now that's cool because now you have a beta weight for region one for trial one, and you have a beta weight for region two on trial one, right? And what you could do is then just correlate whether the beta weights in trial one 
are correlated, or sorry, in region one, are correlated <clears throat> with the beta weights in region two. Yeah? So for example, uh, is the response in V1 correlated to the response in A1, so vision and audition, uh, on a trial by trial basis? Is the, if the response is high on a given trial, are they, are they both high in V1 and A1? Right? So that type of correlation uh, allows you to say something about whether brain regions work together. And that is something that um, we initially were blind to, right? So this type of analysis, and, and in general, uh, resting state also, what we're trying to do is understand the structure of the correlations between what happens in regions, what happens in voxels. Yeah? whether things are activating together. So that's something completely different from just testing whether there is a mean response, different from zero or different from that of another condition. Right? You see how in a standard task-based fMRI experiment where we're not looking at connectivity, we're just trying to get these GLM statistics. We're not interested in whether things happen jointly. Right? We're just looking at whether there is uh, a response. Here, what we're looking at is whether things respond similarly over trials. Because that really indicates that they are performing similar functions. It gives you this extra type of, uh, of analysis and another type of insight on top of that average response. And so in general, uh, what you do is you, in this case, this is all based on atlases. You know what I think about, how I think about atlases. But most of the examples in the literature, and most of the literature in general, uses these atlases. What you do is you average all of the voxels together from your fMRI time series. And so, for example, this red time course would be the average time course of everything that happens in this specific region, right? So over 100 voxels or so. And that means that you have a whole bunch of time courses, let's say 100 for now. <clears throat> And you can just correlate each time course which, uh, with all of the others, right? So you get this full correlation matrix of uh, which regions are connected to which. Then what we in general do um, is we can binarize this connectivity matrix. So this gives us a beautiful view, but, but it's very hard to, to think about, to analyze. And so what people in general do is they binarize this so that they say everything with a correlation of 0 0.3 or higher is connected and everything below is not connected. And you see that then you start getting this binary pattern of this is connected to that and other things aren't connected to other things, if you will. The beauty about that sort of uh, representation is that it easily translates into a graph that you can then plot into the brain. So this really gives you visually also a very nice indication of what is the network because you can actually visualize that network very concretely. So this is the type of representation that, that you generally end up seeing in the literature uh, when you read papers about functional connectivity. Now this specific recipe is about task-based fMRI, but this sort of thing uh, you can also do for resting state fMRI. Yeah. I've been talking about this resting state fMRI. Uh, I've been dropping that term, but I haven't actually explained uh, what it is. So um, let me start by doing that. Um, so as people started using the, uh, the scanner, the fMRI scanner, there's actually initial findings that even use PET imaging in the 90s where people started showing that whenever you don't instruct people to do something, their brains are still fluctuating uh, all over the place. So even when uh, you're telling people, okay, just not, don't do something, don't do anything for about a minute, just you know, lie there in the scanner. We just want to have a baseline for our measurements, right? For our interesting measurements, for example. It turns out that there, no such thing exists really. It's a pipe dream to think that there is an actual baseline because uh, a lot of the energy consumption that our brain goes through is just uh, homeostatic, right? It's just to, to keep everything in order. And even you know this introspectively, right? Uh, when you're just sitting there, so like when you're staring out of the window, you're always doing something, right? You're always mentally occupied with something. If you close your eyes, within a couple of minutes, you'll be thinking about I don't know, the exam, your grandma, the date that you had last week, whatever, right? You'll be thinking of things, right? 
And there is no way to silence people other than anesthetizing them, for example, right? Which is a bit of a hardcore thing to do. So it turns out that everything that happens in this sense, like under the surface, right? That is just happening all the time, this intrinsic activation uh, is the major part of what uses energy inside our brains and uh, evoked brain activity, the stuff that you actually evoke using a stimulus accounts for a small minority of all of the responses that go on uh, in our brains. This is a pretty profound insight, right? Hey, we would like, right? So in a GLM, for example, we would like for our baselines to be baselines and that that's just, you know, this idea of there being a sort of silent brain that we can use as a reference for any activation that we're interested in. But again, caveats, it doesn't exist. The brain doesn't work that way. And so we would want to sort of have this idea of a, a stable baseline, but it doesn't exist. Our brains are always doing uh, something. Yeah? Yes, I'll go into that in a bit. Yeah. Can you, can you somehow draw a line between conscious and unconscious activities? Or just go to... Oh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you, have you read uh, Alice in Wonderland? Yeah. So you know what the term rabbit hole means, right? Yeah. Yeah. So your question is a rabbit hole. Um, uh, and so there's discussions about that. So it's, it's, a, a, it's close to my heart. I, I like this idea of, um, my, my PhD was on dissociating conscious from unconscious processing and then looking at brain uh, correlations and things like that. Um, if you ask me, so is, it, is it like a personal question? Like how are you doing? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I don't believe that you can say this is conscious and this is unconscious. I think that that's that line that people want to draw between those two categories is made up because the two categories are made up, right? Um, for example, if I throw this uh, pointer to your head really quickly, really fast, right? You'll catch it, I hope. Um, but uh, most of that will be unconscious. It's like a reflex that you catch it, right? But then if you look back two seconds later, right? you'll have a complete recall of the instances that went on, right? So somehow in the moment itself, you're unconscious of the entire thing that's happening, right? You're acting. Um, and then two, two seconds later, all of a sudden, you have mental recall and you have sort of conscious awareness of what happened. And so there's all of these, I'm just making up an example here. Um, I just think it's very hard to draw the line. But many people um, think that you can, or at least their research careers depend on the the premise so yeah there's a lot of discussion going on about that sort of thing yeah so a lovely question is you not brain imaging anymore yeah uh <laughs> yeah any other questions it's an interesting phenomenon right the the whole you know your mind is a turbulent thing anyway right and this is just uh the reflection of that in activity measurements of the brain so you will see a lot of literature that uses resting state experiments and then performs resting state functional connectivity analyses um, on their data. Oh, I have a chat question. I'm going to try and, and, and look it up. Yes, you can. Yeah, I'll get into, oh, Emma has a beautiful question. I don't know. Yeah, I won't get into it, um, but I'll get into it later. Okay. So, <clears throat> resting state experiments are weird, in my opinion. So maybe you don't ask me, but you know, you're here, so that's an implicit question. Uh, it's not an experiment. Uh, the general thing that people do is they, uh, say to the participant, okay, please lie down in the scanner. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we're gonna put you in, we're gonna start a measurement, it's gonna make a lot of noise. So we want you to just <clears throat> look at the center of the screen and not move and uh, be as relaxed as possible. And, and here comes the killer. Please do not think about anything in particular. 
Yeah. And then you just scan them for an hour. Um, uh, yeah. So depending on how much money you have, the, that determines how long you would scan them. Um, and um, so, so in, my, in my opinion, it's not actually an experiment um, because uh, you don't know what happened when, you don't know what people are doing. So it's very hard to have an idea of what you're supposed to get out, right? Uh, and I'll get into that in a bit. But on the other hand, you can see how this is a very, very appealing technique to use because you can use it in any context. Yeah? If you're going to be measuring uh, you know, brain responses from small children, yeah, this is something that you can tell a child to do. Well, compliance will be a bit hard in the motion, all of that. You keep seeing examples of what motion does, but in principle, you can do it. Uh, people that have Alzheimer's disease, they'll just barely remember to lie still and fixate, right? But any clinical population, you can do this experiment with. Yeah. And so it's a very, very low bar to pass to be able to get brain data from all manner of populations of, of patients and, um, uh, and subjects. At the same time, <clears throat> it's very easy for the experimenter to do because all you have to do is make a bitmap image of the size of your screen in MS Paint, paint it gray as a background and put a red dot in the middle. You save that and you show it full screen. That's the extent of programming you need to do to run this experiment. Brilliant, right? There's no other requirements. You just need to tell them to fixate. And you, so you need them to have something to fixate, the red dot in the middle. And so very low threshold on all sides. And you can see where the appeal comes from. And so if you go to online databases, uh, where people are amassing huge amounts of data, fMRI data, you'll see that about half is resting state data. It's gorgeous. And somewhat problematic, but it's gorgeous. <clears throat> so what does this what does this give you? All right? Let's say you do this experiment and you just take a random subject. What does this look like in in terms of brain activation? Now, um, in general, what you're going to see is this sort of turbulence that I was talking about. The, the, the fact that you will always have stuff going on, uh, not just in your mind, but also in your brain, right? And, and of course, you would sort of think that the two are connected. So what does that look like? Well, let's have a look. So this is um, an actual like resting state acquisition. Uh, it's sped up a bit. Uh, what you see is a representative. Right? So this is a relatively good acquisition, not that much motion happening, that sort of thing. Um, and what you see is that uh, the brain is always doing its thing. Yeah. You see things go blowing up and down all the time. It's pretty gorgeous, right? You're just looking at someone thinking in a, some weird way. But what do we see? Do you see anything in particular here? No, uh, you just you can say anything. Do you see anything that pops out? Uh, it's now getting a bit jittery, but you do see some structure here, right? It's not just noise, not just speckly noise. Anyone want to shout what they see? Oh, okay. <laughs> Somehow the movie is uh, not behaving. So there's certain standard things that are you are you seeing what I'm seeing? There is some structure there, right? It's not just random crap. You see, for example, that this region here, it always seems to be doing more or less the same thing. Now it's blue, and now it's getting red, right? It seems to be coherent, right? It's doing a similar thing even during the resting state. You also see that specific regions uh, always go, even disjoint regions, always go up and down together. So I'm going to pinpoint a couple. So you saw this thing is blue now. You saw at the same time that this thing is blue. And if, we're, if we look quickly, then we'll also see that this thing is blue at the same time, bilaterally also red now. See? They go together. 
So just looking at this for two minutes, having these data, you would be able to find the default mode network. So that's the default mode network. These regions, they go up and down together. So they have a certain internal consistency in how they, uh, how they work, right? When people are engaging in endogenous thought, and uh, you also see that there's always a back and forth between these regions turning red or blue and these regions turning red or blue. So what that means is that the default mode network regions are in this sort of push-pull with more sensory and motor-related regions. There's always this sort of back and forth between them. Just look, if you see the default mode network regions turn blue, you'll see the sensory regions turn red and vice versa. Great. Let's have a break. Let's ponder this, right? And just realize that when you are pondering this, that is happening in your brains. So uh, let's be back here at uh, five past on that clock, by the way. So that, that would be eight or 10 minutes. So now you're all afraid to leave because you need to keep an eye on that clock. I think you're, you know, you're fine to just... Thank you. 
Ah, someone gave me a laptop. Thank you. Um, does the person whose laptop this is need it back, or can I keep it? <laughs> oh, yeah. So I don't know about you, but I, I find this uh, this movie of resting state activations uh, pretty uh, mesmerizing. Right? As you're looking at someone's brain sort of thinking. Um, and, um, you know, because that's the case, in a very broad sense, it, it stands to reason that uh, for certain clinical uh, things, certain disorders, certain mental states, you would think that that is different, right? Somehow this resting state, the patterns of resting state connectivity are different. And it turns out that that is really the case also, right? So there's a lot of work done uh, looking at resting state connectivity between specific regions, um, but also other uh, methodologies. And here people are looking specifically at the subthalamic nucleus, because that's the reason where one would put the uh, deep brain stimulation electrode in Parkinson's disease. That's just a critical region, um, that sort of thing. There's others by, you know, relating to pain and, and the effect of placebos, for example. Uh, there's also uh, Alzheimer's disease connectivity with hippocampus, right? And so you're seeing in a couple of these examples, these are just two examples. That's still here. Yeah. 
In these couple of examples, you already see one mode in which you can uh, start to look at this type of data. You can start to pinpoint a specific location in the brain and then see what other regions correlate with that region's activations in the resting state. So that's cool. It's also very easy to do. Uh, so how do you go about this sort of uh, resting state functional connectivity? Well, this is the same sort of pipeline uh, that you uh, that you would implement uh, as with the task-based MRI. Right? So there's no real difference uh, other than that here these are continuous time courses; they're not beta weights. Otherwise, the, the analysis is very very uh, similar. So um, the really nice thing is you don't have to do an actual experiment, right? You just ask people to uh, lie still in the scanners, totally chill. Um, and uh, yeah, like I just said, the analyses are all very similar to what we could also do with task-based fMRI. And usually people use regions of interest for this. Uh, this also means if, if we just take a step back quickly, right? Uh, this also means that if you take an atlas and just average 100 or so voxels together uh, and then start correlating that with uh, other regions, of course, there are all the pitfalls that we talked about uh, that have to do with the use of atlases, uh, the co-registration across participants in an experiment, uh, you know, the individuality of brain organization across different members of our species, uh, all of that, right, that all goes into this. So an analysis like this is inherently forced because you're averaging across such large populations of voxels. Uh, it's inherently also quite different from this idea that you want to know exactly what each voxel represents in terms of information processing, like we saw in the encoding models lecture. Right? The approach here is a much more data-driven one and a much more broad strokes one. And I want you to realize that that is the case. Right? You now know the sort of landscape of different possibilities a bit, uh, and this allows you to place this type of approach in that landscape. You get an idea of the things that you could do with this type of approach and the things that you could not do, perhaps. Yeah? So the task-based uh, experiments are very much on activating the brain. Uh, this is kind of like somewhat neutral, but do you also have like the relaxing side, such as yoga or meditation, and then to see what uh, the brain activity does, does that like the complete opposite of uh, the task space, or would you get similar results as the resting space? Yeah, so uh, this is a good point uh, because people do experiments where they try to manipulate the, the sort of a mental content during the resting state, right? And so if you ask someone to meditate for five minutes and then ask them to imagine having a very painful left foot for five minutes, uh, you could you know, do this whole analysis pipeline, right? Uh, and then find that certain brain regions correlate with one another in one condition, but not in the other, right? The end result here, like from this level, like so these, these input data are different. So this means that this correlation matrix is probably going to be different, which means that if you binarize that matrix to perform this uh, graph construction operation, then you'll find a different graph if the differences are large enough, yes. There's even, uh, and I'm not, okay, now you're, you're tempting me to start uh, going into a certain direction. So there's also um, uh, an analysis technique that's called time varying uh, resting state analysis, where people just do this entire analysis for chunks of a minute of data, uh, and then they slide it across the, uh, the data set. So let's say if you have 15 minutes, you could do it like minute chunks. You get 15 measurements over time uh, of the connectivity structure within those minutes. Um, and then you can look at, you know, dynamic changes in the resting state connectivity, right? So uh, yeah, the, the sky is the limit, the world is your oyster sort of thing, right? Uh, anything that you can think of, you can in principle do. Uh, and it's all a big data analysis exercise. So it's fun. Um, yeah, so uh, in general, uh, this sort of thing uh, requires uh, that you understand things like, uh, uh, graph theory and that sort of thing. Uh, but the, the simplest analyses, like I also showed you in those clinical examples, are much more straightforward and they have to do. Ooh, why am I trying to take a picture? Um, they have to do. Yay. Um, 
usually by being much more focused, right? And you saw this example, these two examples in the clinical sense also, uh, where we have a specific brain region that we think is implicated in some sort of uh, disorder. Uh, we use that as what we call a seed region, right? So we take the signals from that region, we correlate it uh, to uh, the rest of the brain. And what we then get, for example, is these seed to brain connectivity maps. Okay? So this gives us a way of sort of condensing the movie that we saw into a single image in terms of what is connected to that single uh, seed location. So in this case, this is in the temporal junction. I think most people would uh, say that this is still part of that default mode network. And what you then see is that all of the uh, regions in the brain that have to do with things like attention, outwardly directed attention, uh, they are negatively correlated with that. That's what the blue color, color stands for. Yeah. So a very simple analysis. You just pick a voxel and correlate the rest of the brain with the time course of that voxel. It's very simple. So you can do this also by selecting specific regions, for example, from an earlier uh, experiment, right? You can do a task-based experiment, perform a GLM, and then say, ah, these are now my regions of interest, and then look at the resting state connectivity between those regions of interest. So that means that you have already zoomed into a network of regions that you think are involved in a specific type of cognitive process. That's what you see uh, here. And then you can also, yeah, really look at the connectivity matrix, not just based on an atlas, but based on specific regions of interest that you're interested in. Yeah. So this is the way that you generally approach this sort of analysis. Uh, you first want to have a clear idea of what you're looking for, because otherwise you end up with a huge data analysis problem uh, that becomes really, really difficult, like technically very demanding. You can throw, what is it, the kitchen sink at it in terms of analysis techniques, right? So you can go full on machine learning on a resting state data set. Uh, the interpretability, though, uh, becomes an issue at some point. Now, that interpretability is a problem in resting state in general because um, we're not doing an actual experiment, right? Um, and so uh, we want to, in the general GLM, right, we talked about how you can regress out these factors of movement, right? Because you have your signal that you think is going to behave a certain way, then you can try to regress out the sample movement. You can do a similar analysis for resting state. So you can actually do uh, high pass filtering. So that's deleting the slow fluctuations in the signal. Uh, you can do uh, uh, this global brain signal that I also showed you in the MRIQC outputs, right? In the, uh, the, the fluctuations of the entire brain that could be also due to movement or breathing or whatever. Um, you can do this uh, uh, CSF and white matter thing, right? You can try to take out all of these nuisances also from resting state, right? So clean it up, clean it up, clean it up. The problem at some point becomes that with no idea of what people were doing, we don't have a clear idea what our signal should look like. And if we cannot identify our signal, it becomes impossible to draw the line between what is signal and what is noise. Because everything could be noise, everything could be signal, very hard to say which is which. Yeah. Now contrast that to a very simple experiment where you show a stimulus once every 10 seconds. Well, at least you know that you should have an activation every 10 seconds, right? Here, no clue. And so just fundamentally, conceptually, it is very, very hard to make sure that whatever you get out, especially if you're using very intricate data analysis pipelines, for example, uh, whether that is not due in to some extent to things like movement, things like arousal that impact the brain's total sort of signal, signature, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. So for example, there are studies where people give people uh, LSD and psilocybin and then do a risk state experiment. Well, you're going to be, uh, yeah, it's my uh, sort of frame of reference. Um, and so you can imagine that if people are really tripping balls in the scanner, as opposed to a placebo condition, uh, they are like behaving quite differently. They might start getting jittery. 
uh, they might move differently, they might breathe differently, all of those different things might be the case. And if I can't separate signals from noise, then how am I going to, in my inference, say this is a neural effect that's caused by the psilocybin or LSD administration, right? Uh, it becomes exceedingly hard, right? And so I think as a field, we are struggling with that. We do not know exactly how to go about this. So it's a fundamental question here. What is signal and what is noise? And, and we don't have a handle on this in a very deep sense in a resting state. Any questions about that? Because I'm going to go into like data analysis techniques that you can use and this and that. But it's, um, I think this is a interesting maybe point. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm not an expert. Um, but uh, it kind of, it, so I know that there are sleep stage differences, for example. Um, now, these are more intricate than you might expect. Um, so, for example, uh, I know, for example, that in the, there's a contrast, this is done in monkeys, but the, um, uh, you can anesthetize a monkey in the scanner versus not, right? And then the difference in resting state connectivity is actually not as large as you would expect. So, the, for example, this back and forth between default mode network and more sensory regions, that sort of major axis of uh, brain fluctuations, it still exists under anesthesia. Um, so, uh, yeah. I'd have to look up some literature to really answer your question, if that's okay. But uh, we can talk about it later. Yeah. Um, sleep is something that I um, I just love to do mostly. Um, yeah. Any other questions? You get this idea, right? You're you're performing this resting state experiment. It's beautiful. You get all this data. But where do you draw the line? Yeah. Great. Now, like I said, you want to start your analysis by doing something that you know makes sense, right? So for example, in those clinical studies, you pinpoint a region as a seed, and then you look at how the rest of the brain corresponds to that region's activation, right? That's what the functional connectivity allows you to do. But you can also imagine that that is very, very sensitive to your initial preoccupations, right? If you think that some region is important, uh, you might be missing some other region that might be much more important, but like no one else had looked at it before. And so it's not part of your hypothesis. And so you can't know, right? If, if it, you don't select it as a seed ever, then it doesn't uh, pop out in your analysis. So very important to uh, sometimes also use more data-driven uh, approaches. And I just want to highlight uh, one or two examples. <clears throat> so, um, and I'm not going to explain the, the method in detail. I just want to show you this as an example of how people use um, specific, more data driven techniques to also analyze, for example, resting state data. So, um, what independent components analysis does is it tries to, it takes this big matrix of voxels by time points, and it tries to find structure in that in a data-driven sense, because it tries to find spatial components that have a specific time force uh, that are uh, together uh, maximally independent from the rest of the activation. So you can find groups of voxels that co-activate in a data-driven way. Yeah? So this is a standard data analysis, uh, signal decomposition technique. It's similar to, for those of you that are aficionados, similar to PCA, and it's very easily implemented in a neural network. All of that is, you can just, it's two lines of Python code, you can actually perform this on the brain. And so what you get out is exactly what I just said, these groups of voxels that co-fluctuate. Okay? And of course, because they co-fluctuate, they also have a common time force. And so what this means is that you sort of, what you get out is a set of components that together make up the total uh, brain activation. So you can ask this procedure to give you 20 or 100, uh, depending on how many time points and how many voxels you have. Um, and uh, the first components 
will give you uh, the strongest fluctuation. So that it is the broadest networks that have uh, the largest explained variance in color. And then as you move towards higher modes, higher uh, components, uh, you get uh, smaller components that in terms of total variance explained are, uh, are smaller. Now, this is the type of thing that you get out. So uh, let's say you have a voxel and this is your measured signal. That voxel is actually uh, part of a few of these different components. Each of these components has a straighter profile and any given voxel uh, can take part in multiple of these components. And together, when you decompose this, uh, you see that, for example, you have here a task response. This was a block design. Uh, there is some reflection of that block design also in this voxel. Uh, there's also specific machine noise, right? There's specific MRI artifacts uh, that this can pick up, for example. Those can be all odd slices have a certain structure. ICA will find it. You can also uh, find the, like pulsatility artifacts, right? What it will find in most cases, if you run it on the brain, is it will find that circle of pulse around the brainstem uh, as a spatial pattern uh, that then has this very peaked uh, time course that reflects the heartbeat, right? That's that pulsation of the large vasculature in the center of the brain. ICA will find it. And you will also have things like a, a arousal or things that, that relate to breathing. Uh, or if you were to administer like an uh, uh, anesthetic, you'd see that also uh, popping up in this sort of analysis. And so this is what you would, uh, what that would look like, right? You get a spatial map for each of these components uh, and uh, you get a temporal time course. You can also look at its, we talked about that earlier, right? You can also uh, look at its uh, frequency spectrum. So this component is always a combination of a spatial map uh, and its time course. And the collection of these different components, if you add them together, gives you back your data. So it's like a latent structure in the data that independent component analysis finds. Now, what are the standard components that you find, if you do this on 100 subjects, you will find structure that's common across subjects. And these are a few examples. So people call these resting state networks, because these are those components that fluctuate together. And as you have people just think about their grandmas or whatever in this resting state experiment. And so uh, you often get these uh, specific networks among which, of course, this uh, default mode network, they always activate together. You saw that in that movie. Yeah? And so independent component analysis picks those up, just finds them. You also have a visual uh, network, for example, here. You see that that's with the visual system. Then you have this self-referential system. It's where the, all of the value-based decision-making processes happen and all your, how do I feel about myself? Sort of thing. Um, and then you have like a different attention network, like is a, this a dorsal attention network is uh, when you direct attention outward, but based on an instruction or what you want. Whereas this ventral attention network uh, is how you direct attention based on cues from the outside world. So it's like you're in traffic and something uh, happens that you see, it picks up your attention. Uh, that's what the ventral attention does. And anything language and auditory related, it also has its own network. You can imagine that these sorts of functionality actually trade off in your resting state cognition. Right? As you think about different things, sometimes you're listening to self-talk, right? What about you know, you're talking to yourself sort of silently in your head? And other things, you're doing something that's more, you know, just imagining how you would navigate home as you're finally let out of the scanner, right? Uh, it's a completely different type of uh, cognition. And we already know from that decoding lecture, right? When you ask people to walk around in their house mentally versus playing tennis, it gives you completely different patterns of activation, right? Uh, this is just a way of picking up those patterns of activation during the resting state from the data. Yeah, and this is the result that you get. So whenever you see that sort of thing, don't be scared. Uh, it's actually very simple. Also conceptually, internally, it's not a very complicated analysis. Uh, but this is uh, what you might see in, in certain uh, outputs. It's important to be able to identify those. 
Now that's all great, right? So we can actually make sense of these resting state fluctuations. But um, again, we're still stuck with this problem where how do you compare across subjects, right? You have to like go to M and I space and say, ah, yeah, your component 12, it looks a bit like this other subjects component nine in that they're both similar to the resting state network. So let's just say that nine and 11, or what did I just say, uh, are the same thing and then we'll average them together sort of thing. So group analysis is really fraught here. And so uh, we wanna go a bit further and uh, we wanna really look at how different subjects are uh, similar. And we want to go in that direction, right? We want to draw conclusions about how different people, people's cognition works. Uh, but how do we uh, do that? We also want to know, for example, how similar different people's cognitions are. Right? We want to go to that population level, but how do we do it? So uh, this has been uh, developed over the last couple of uh, decades. There's a lot on the slide, but let me unpack it for you. Right? Um, so if you do a resting state analysis and you want to compare across two subjects, very hard because no people, no two people are thinking the same thing at the same time when you just ask them to lie still, right? People are unique, good and bad. So the problem with this resting state is there is no real link between two brains. And so you really can't say, I'm now picking this voxel in one brain and I'm correlating it with someone else's brain, right? In order to be able to do that, you need to know that the two are linked in terms of a stimulus. And that is why when people are interested in intersubject correlations, what in general they do is they show movies or they do something else. Like have people listen to stories. You want to engage as much of the brain as possible. You want to have a naturalistic stimulus and you want that stimulus to be yoked across subjects, right? You want it to have exactly the same time force across two different subjects, because only then you can pick a voxel in one brain and see how that voxel connects to all of the voxels in someone else's brain. Okay? So you can trade off a seed in one brain region from one person uh, with the activations in another brain. You can go across brains. I think that's a pretty nice sort of thing that you can do in principle. Like the idea is nice. Like you sort of, sort of relate your brain activation uh, with someone else's. And so uh, here, these are four subjects, right? So this is from A1, so that's auditory cortex. Uh, subject one, subject two, subject three, subject four. Uh, and you see that they are very similar in terms of how they respond uh, to specific inputs. Yeah. And so you could find here, a, there, there'd be a pretty high uh, correlation there, right? So in if these came from the same brain, you would say, ah, they're connected, uh, which is funny, right? So what you're looking at is similarities in terms of how different brains analyze that given stimulus, that rich stimulus. So it's really having this synced experience between subjects that allows us to be able to perform this analysis. And the beauty of this is that you can actually do pretty cool things then. Uh, for example, uh, what you see here on the left bottom is a study from uh, NYU where uh, they are um, they're doing this analysis. So for every voxel, for every location in the brain, what they're quantifying is how strongly the signals in one person's brain are the same as the responses in other people's brains. So you get this beautiful map of how similar brains are when they're watching a movie. And you see that this scales with how interesting uh, the movie is. So this is Washington Square Park. It's a, it's a sort of movie where someone is just walking along Washington Square Park in real sort of at real speed, right? So like this in Washington Square Park, which is just a park with a big arc in the middle. So it's like a square next to the university. And so not that much happens so, there. Not, you're not yoked to each other, right? You're not all synced to each other in terms of brain activation because it's boring, right? Because everybody's just sitting there like, yeah, now nah, I know this. I just, you know, I just walked through this park to get to the scanner. Uh, and so you're just doing something that's very similar to resting state, right? Everybody thinking their own thoughts because it's a boring stimulus. But as you then make the stimulus more interesting, 
you see that the patterns of activation become more and more similar across different participants. So that I really find very, very cool because you actually see that this is a, this is a neural measurement of movie quality, right? Uh, you know, it's true IMDB. This is what tells you whether everybody experiences a movie in the same way, right? If a director is really good, they are taking you by the hand and really conducting your experience, right? Um, and um, that's what you actually see happening here. So it turns out that, uh, you know, spaghetti westerns aren't so bad and Hitchcock really was a good, very good director. So you get the, the charm here, right? I think it's a, I like it. It's playful. And uh, that I think has merit. It's more of you're showing them a stimulus and expecting yourself in the context. There's the, you're not quantifying it in the technique. Yeah, it's very data driven still. Yeah, yeah. And the quantification that you're doing is also still very simple, right? It's just a correlation. Um, yeah, you're just what you're measuring is really how much of the brain is synced to the uh, movie in the same way across individuals. Yeah, yeah. But it's, um, yeah. And it doesn't pretend to be more, right? It's just a fun way of, you know, IMDb probably paid for that study. I don't know. But you see this. So you see where the idea of functional connectivity, i.e., looking at the correlation structure between voxels. Uh, where that uh, comes from, right, in the, in, in the previous slides, and how you can then start to play with this concept uh, across observers, right? If you know that you can have a handle on this correlation structure, you could do the playful thing and say, ha, huh, what about across observers? That would be interesting, okay? And you can go even further, uh, which, of course, people do. Um, you can even... <laughs> You can even do this across species. So in this study, uh, people showed the same movie to monkeys and to humans. Then it means by the same logic, right? You can pick a voxel in a human and correlate its time course with the monkey brain, yeah? So it's really uh, this sort of thing is using that movie as a link between two brains. And in this case, across species even pretty out there, but it works. And um, so th that's what you're doing, right? You're taking uh, a, you can take like a, a voxel in a monkey brain and correlate it uh, with all of the voxels uh, in a human brain uh, or uh, vice versa, as you see here. Yeah. So very simple still, you can see this as a sort of seed-based analysis or, or what have you, uh, but the logic is the same, right? You're just, you're trying to get at this correlation structure. And in this case, it's not just for fun. Well, it's always for fun, but What's important here is that it allows you to then trace how the brain, how the brain organization of these two species bifurcated, right? What is different? Because if you do this all throughout the brain and they end up being exactly the same, right? Uh, so there's no really like changes in, in organization that you see from that. You know that they're very, very similar species. Uh, it turns out from this, um, from this analysis uh, that that's not the case. So what you can do is do monkey, monkey, you can do monkey monkey uh, seed based correlation where this uh, PIT is the seed region, and you see that there's a bunch of visual regions here uh, that activate similarly, right? So you see this is a source region, and it's just a bunch of visual regions there. But if you then take this region and you do monkey human uh, connectivity, you actually see that the structure of the human visual, the high level visual system that you see here in the monkey, is actually quite different. It, it, it arcs there. So the connectivity with that region arcs over there, so in that direction instead of uh, like so. And you see that there's actually a supplementary region uh, that's there that seems to be performing a similar role, yeah? And so what you have here is a, a very sort of appealing way of being able to relate brain regions across species in terms of their functionality, right? Because they're both working on the same movie material. Movements that we think of the 
Uh, yeah, um, uh, there are. Uh, they're very similar to human movies, but they're then tailored to monkeys. Um, so it turns out that in the frontal cortex of monkeys, there's an actually the people that generally we're all uh, blind to the frontal cortex of the monkey sort of thing. There's a few eye movement regions there about there. Uh, otherwise, all of this is sort of uh, people don't really understand what it does. Until this reviewer from uh, sorry, sorry, this um, a researcher from Columbia University in, in New York started doing experiments where they let the monkey see not Sergio Leone uh, spaghetti Western movies, uh, but actually movies. There's this beautiful documentary. Uh, I don't know if you know it, Monkey Kingdom. It's like a Disney documentary. You should watch it. Anyway, there, you know, it's a uh, social situations uh, that monkeys are in, right? So they're like foraging and they're like uh, doing their sort of uh, uh, cuddling things and whatever it is that they do, right? And it turns out that then you see a lot of activation uh, throughout the brain. So they're really tr then trying to interpret the social situation that the, um, that the conspecifics are, are in, right? Uh, and that's the sort of cognitive operation also uh, that a lot of the brain is devoted to, right? They're also a social species. That's also what we're, what our brains do a lot, yeah. So yeah, if you don't have a stimulus that's tailored to the subject, then of course, then yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you want to know? Yeah. Um, so, so the the monkeys are generally uh, they're not lying down on their backs. They don't like that. Uh, so they're put in what's called a sphinx position, like in the Egyptian sphinx thing. So they're in like this sort of chair that that they're upright. Um, and then uh, they, these are all plastic. So they're sort of uh, transparent. Uh, and they sort of uh, screw something into the skull of the monkey so that they're still. Um, yeah, and they're never still. Um, and then the monkeys, they inject with uh, what's called myon, there's manganese iron oxide particles, um, which gives a sort of bold response type thing, but much, much stronger. Um, and so it has a different shape for bold response, but you can still uh, uh, work with it. Um, and so you just show them the same, same movies. A bit, it's a bit horrific. Uh, yeah, like animal research is sort of a strong stomach material. Yeah, um, but it works. It's in in all other respects, it's very very similar to human work. Yeah. Um, yeah, interesting, right? Not that, but this. Okay. Um, I just wanted to highlight uh, one thing. Emma has a question. Ah, yes, yes. So time lag things. Um, I'll show you something similar to what your question is about, and hopefully we can then talk more, right? Um, I showed you this movie earlier on also. Um, this is that slide that goes into the cross-subject variation in terms of anatomies, right? So again, this is the curvature pattern of many different subjects, but all mapped onto the same standard surface, right? And you see that there's just so much variation in, in exactly where these uh, sulci are, right? Uh, this is based on the best possible alignment that we have nowadays. There's just so much inter-observer, inter inter-participant uh, variation. And this also means, of course, that if we pick one voxel here from one person's brain, yeah, you know, it's not going to be the same voxel in another person's brain, right? And that is a conceptual problem. That inter-individual variability is something that we need to work on. Um, it just turns out that we have a very nice method to fix this uh, problem in this connectivity uh, arena. Um, so it's called hyper-alignment because it's a technique developed by an American. <laughs> And uh, what it does is it tries to align different individual brains, not based on the curvature pattern of the, uh, of the anatomy, for example, or um, the histology or what have you. Uh, but what it does uh, is it performs what's called a procrustis analysis. What that does is it takes that connectivity profile of a uh, given subject's brain. Uh, and it tries to map it 
uh, on to another uh, subject's connectivity profile. So what this means is that the voxels are not being aligned in terms of anatomy, but they're being aligned in terms of their correlation structure. This means then uh, that you can create a sort of common space uh, where these fluctuations live. Uh, and that gives you a sort of functional, functionally defined based on connectivity patterns, for example, alignment between subjects. And it also means that your uh, alignment be between subjects becomes much stronger, much better. Right? And especially in these regions where there is large intersubject variability, uh, this can change how uh, voxels overlap with one another. And you see an example of that here, for example, during uh, movie viewing, right? Uh, this is the intersubject correlation uh, when you do just anatomical alignment. So there's some correlation, but it's very, very specific and, and mostly in the back of the brain. Uh, and here is the connectivity after you align these subjects use, using this uh, hyperalignment tool. So this procrustis analysis is a very standard uh, data analysis uh, that you can perform. So in any package, you can uh, immediately implement it. Um, and uh, yeah, this is one way in which people are trying to use, let's say, the information processing character characteristics that we can map using fMRI uh, in order to find this common space in which subjects are more similar. Of course, this is like a machine learning type approach where you should never use the same data for the alignment and then for the analysis, right? This should be separate parts of your data. Uh, but if that's, as long as that's the case, uh, then uh, it will help produce more similar patterns across subjects. So I hope that this shows you then that, you know, all of this connectivity analysis, it's not just, you know, sort of made up data analysis, uh, but it does give us a different perspective on how fMRI data work, right? and it can allow us to, in some way, alleviate or fix certain problems that we have if we only look at the data itself. And connectivity is, in that sense, a very beautiful sort of uh, way of looking at higher order aspects of uh, brain activations. Um, that's all I have for now. So uh, I hope to see you perhaps later during the practical. If not, then I'll see you on Friday. Um, remember to, again, I'm just going to reiterate, um, if you have uh, questions, well, so if you have questions about the practicals in that, you just find them boring and they're too handholdy, then do check out the project notebook that I put online uh, in the pages of the, of the Canvas, uh, the course on Canvas, because um, they're cool. So for example, if you want to do an internship in the lab and you're interested in the type of research that we do, check those projects out because they're, they're much more similar to the stuff that we do in the lab uh, as compared to the practicals. Yeah? Excellent. Time for coffee, people. I mean, practical. Monkey Kingdom vind ik echt fantastisch. Ja, precies. Um, ik weet het niet. Ik vind het een hele leuke vraag. Um, ja, je zou een boek van uh, Frans de Waal of zo moeten lezen. Omdat, uh, die, die doet dat soort dingen. Die doet dat soort onderzoek wel. Ja. Ik ben benieuwd hoe ver 